All right, welcome everybody to the Open Business Council Summit. I am Mae McCreary, uh, the moderator for today. I'm with Minecracker, and today is made possible by Minecracker in partnership with C Sharp Corner. Uh, for those of you that don't know, C Sharp Corner is a community of software and data developers of 3 million members with 5 million visitors monthly, whose goal is to learn, share, and inspire. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel for today. We have all three Microsoft regional directors. First, we have Alan O'Neill from Ireland. Alan is a member of the C Sharp Corner community as well as the CTO for the DataWorks. And then we have Mahesh Chan. Mahesh is the uh, founder of C Sharp Corner as well as Minecracker outside of the Philadelphia area. And finally, we have Magnus Martinson from Sweden. Magnus is an entrepreneur and consultant in the cloud business and architecture field as well as the CEO of LoftySoft. So all three of you are in senior IT positions. How have things changed since the beginning of the pandemic? Can you guys speak a little on, on that to start us off? We can indeed. And I think we're all like angling, trying to figure out who gets to go first. And I did because I was fastest. <laughs> and so I have been inside of this room basically since February. And that's extremely weird for someone like me. And uh, those of the, the people who know me know that I enjoy uh, meeting people, communicating, interacting, and I love traveling to conferences. I go and deliver all kinds of consulting and things on a global scale. Um, I could go to, to, to Sydney or somewhere. I live in Sweden or, or the US, but this year has been nothing. So it's changed a lot for someone like me. And if you, scope that out to the industry, our industry, the, the, the technology industry, my goodness, we, we work from home a lot. We are fortunate. We are the fortunate ones that all of a sudden everything could possibly just be done from home. Uh, it, it used to be the case that, oh, you have to be on site. You have to meet the customer. You have to be there in the team, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Everyone can work from home. Yeah, I mean, Go ahead, Alan. From my point of view, it's interesting because um, people say I have been training for this all my life because uh, I work mostly remotely. So to me, it's, it's life as normal. And it's interesting because a large proportion, a very large proportion of the IT industry, um, yes, they, they would previously have um, commuted and gone to work every morning and gone to an office and... Um, uh, met people and all of these things and wonderful collaboration and um, uh, water fountain conversations, ad hoc things for sparking brilliant ideas and everything else. Um, but mostly I didn't do that. And there's actually a whole different part of the IT industry, and I'm sure some others, um, that predominantly work remotely. And um, uh, for me, most of my work has always been um, uh, doing things remotely and working with people in different time zones. Um, so probably for me, it's it's not so different. The um, only downside for me is not being able to go and uh, meet up with my friends in far-flung uh, corners of the world. Mahesh? Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, May. First of all, good question. Uh, actually, as my, you know, Magnus and uh, Alan already said, you know, we all, most of us work from home. Which is a good thing for you know as, as far as work wise but obviously so many people who are struggling we feel for them and hopefully things get better soon um besides work i think you know the conferences we do c sharp corner conferences we do we definitely miss that part you know traveling to india and also you know i do a lot of speaking at conferences and events here in the us as well in different cities so the traveling part and the speaking and interacting people that part is definitely kind of we are kind of at the stage where like come on when can we you know get going uh, so that's really the missing part otherwise you know things are from at least people who are in tech who are in software development uh, they're not that bad compared to you know other fields yeah thank you all for sharing and uh, moving forward Today, we are going to discuss emerging technologies, including cloud computing, IoT, AI and machine learning, blockchain, voice-enabled system, and mobile apps. So, Alan, I'll 
direct this question to you first. I know you are involved in a lot of these technologies. What do you see as the fastest growing um, of all of these emerging technologies? The one that covers absolutely everything, the one that will be everywhere, and the one that there are most opportunities is AI. And AI um, uh, is not separate from blockchain or IoT or cloud or any of these things. It is something that is becoming fast to be part of the plumbing of everything. And it will be, is being used um, to optimize everywhere. Um, it is being used to add value tremendously from a business point of view. And if you think even, oh, my business doesn't need AI, we just do, you know, basic stuff. Um, I guarantee you, if you get somebody in who um, uh, knows a little bit even, enough to be dangerous about AI, um, and knows a little bit about your domain and your business, um, they'll be able to find a way that um, can help you improve your business um, by ejecting some machine learning and some AI in there. And, and by the way, one of the important things to know about this is that AI is not like the end of the world, the robots are coming, okay? Um, AI is very stupid. AI is like a computer. It will do exactly what you tell it to do, okay? So um, don't be afraid of it. Uh, embrace it. It's not going to um, uh, do people uh, out of a job. It's going to create new jobs, and it's going to free us up to do more interesting and more worthwhile things. So AI is the, the top of everything, and it will only improve things and spread uh, even wider and better in all of the industries that and the areas that you mentioned. Yeah, well, in, uh, I think to add to that, Alan, what Alan just said, you know, as you, you know, we all can chime in as well, uh, Magnus. When you know people think of AI, they always think of, as Alan said, you know, robots are coming and you know machines are running our lives. But AI in today's uh, day, almost every large corporation is already using AI, right? For example, you get all these emails, and emails you get, oh, this is a this this email goes to your spam, this goes to your inbox, this goes to your prioritize. This is part of AI. You go to Facebook and all you see is the content um, that is just really, you know, relevant to you. The, the, these things are already happening and your systems are already using AI. You know, look at this, your iPhone and you open iPhone with your face recognition. It's part of all AI machine learning. Face recognition is a part of that. So these things are already happening. Either look at our car. We get in the car, car recognizes us, right? Our home systems and so on and so forth. So as Ellen said, AI is everywhere. Before um, Magnus um, answers, because I know he'll appreciate this one, um, uh, people say, okay, but what's the difference between AI and machine learning? Um, and it's really simple. Um, AI is written in PowerPoint and machine learning is written in Python. That's it. Okay. So, in other words, when we say AI, especially from a business point of view, um, don't think of it as something magic because it's not. Every programming language comes down to three things, if, then, else. And this is what we do when we wake up in the morning. We say, uh, oh, is this a weekend? Great. I lie in bed. No, I get up out of bed and I put my foot in front of the other. It's just if, then, else. Everything is binary. Everything is simple. It's not something you have to worry about. It's something you need to embrace. So, Magnus? No, that's cool. I, I want to be be brief about it. I loved your answer. It's it's to the point. AI is is probably my pick as well. What's interesting is that AI obviously existed before the cloud, and AI exists still. And I was there when the cloud was a, a teeny tiny baby, right? I, I worked in this industry before the cloud, and then the cloud could like at the beginning it could deploy your web application, right? Or that that was like the cloud, right? And we've had data centers before. Um, though cloud technology is different uh, in so fact that you can just provision anything you need and and be built by the minute you you consume it. But some years down that line, we have now cloud te technology that is uh, very very uh, sophisticated. And the things we have built on top of that is that we have added things like we have enabled AI capability and AI power to everyone through cloud technology. So with many of these IoT, AI, many of these technologies did exist before the cloud, but have been 
very, very seriously democratized through cloud technology. Now everyone can use it. And yeah. one thing really interesting there, and it's something that everybody has said, uh, the magic in all of these things is when you bring everything together. Yeah, and, and basically automate it, right? Automation is the key where we don't have to manually do the work. Yeah. And that's what machine learning is all about. That machine, we put some algorithms there, machine figures this out and do work for you while you're sleeping. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your input. Um, really interesting I to hear the perspective of uh, that machine learning or AI is, is stupid. I think I definitely think the general consensus around AI is, you know, robots are going to take over. So um, it's nice to hear that reassurance. <laughs> um, all right. So the next question, uh, Magnus, I know you work closely with Microsoft as your team and CTO. Where do you see this cloud computing is going and what is the future of Microsoft Azure? What uh, and what other exciting things do you see coming out uh, from Microsoft in the future? Yeah, so that's a that's a really small question. <laughs> that covers everything. So I I was Bye. fortunate. To, yeah, I was fortunate <laughs> to to get onto that um, cloud journey as it as it emerged, right? And and I consider myself very fortunate to be early in there. Um, in the early days, there was not much business to be had in that space. There was a cloud, there was technology there, but not every company or very few companies were actually already doing it. But now everyone is doing it. So it's a technology shift more than anything, because what we are seeing now is that, that Azure is the cloud which is present in the most uh, geography spaces in the world. I mean. They're all global. AWS is global. Google Cloud is global. Sure, fine. But Microsoft Azure has the most, by far, regional data centers that deliver the, the cloud capacity known as Azure. In fact, I live in Sweden, and just the other week, it was announced uh, that the data centers that we already knew Microsoft had purchased land for and were building in Sweden were actually going to deliver Azure. It was announced. and just. This last week, it's actually this Monday, this week, Monday, Microsoft announced a massive investment in Denmark, and it's also going to deliver Azure. So I see that, you know, corporations like Microsoft, like Amazon, they have data centers in everywhere and, and virtually they will have in, in every country. And basically then, are we back to what we had before? Data centers that you could hire space in? Yes. But the difference is technology, the technology shift, where you pay by the minute, you you uh, you know pay pay per per use, and the billing model is quite different. Um, that paired with what Mahesh was talking about, automation, is the is the huge key there because you will uh, effectively um, make things much more agile and easy to use. You want to run a massive workload that requires five thousand machines, not a problem. There's a million physical servers or more. That's not an official number in the data center in Ireland. Um, physical servers. And then you virtualize on top of that. So the technology is going to just keep growing. And the types of workloads that you put on there have been increasing in... Um, it's been increasing in, in sort of sophistication, right? It started with, hey, I can deploy my website. Yay, I can store my files. So what? But now it's like AI, machine learning, massive things um, that they are building higher level experiences on top of the, 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 the capacity that we have in place everywhere now. Isn't it interesting, um, Magnus, uh, you know, someone said to me one time quite recently, uh, like they say, what's AI? They say, what's a cloud? Well, it's somebody else's computer, right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And um, if we look at uh, you know, in, in the past, what we did, we started out and we, we had our own buildings and we, we had our own stack of servers and our yeah. server rooms. And um, then, you know, we shoved those into um, warehouses and uh, we would colo a server down to there and physically own our server, but they would maybe manage putting, you know, RAID disks in and out and pressing yeah. the physical button if something went wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we very much had a, we had this split 
between IT pros who kind of managed the the physical hardware devices and the networks and all of these systems that ran on those. And then we had the sort of the developer side, the, the developer engineering side over here. Um, could you maybe talk to uh, uh, the future of uh, Azure? Because I see it as something that has a real edge over Google and um, AWS because Microsoft has always been a developer company at its core, right? Yeah. Um, sure, it's got the enterprise stuff, but it's always had this developer-centric um, core. And it seems yeah. now that part of the magic for me, at least, you know, um, is I can open, um, be it Visual Studio or VS Code or whatever, and I have this like such integration in there that mm -hmm. I can bypass all these things and suddenly I am the cloud. Could you yeah. address that kind of development maybe? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that you say that because with, it, it started out quite differently uh, with, with the, the cloud being very, very techy and complicated. It's still technology focused, of course, uh, a lot of it when you come down to that level from away from business and, and marketing and others and you come down to the tech part. but. What we see now is this this massive ease of use uh, being driven harder and harder into everything that we do, and I mean there's there's a, even a, a way to use these capacities if you're not, if you're low tech if you don't know very much about it and it, it, and that's that's an interesting aspect as well. But if we stay with with technology, we started out with having a a, a um, just a new technology shift. And uh, now we see things like Azure, you, you couldn't possibly compete with Microsoft, no matter who you are, when it comes to development environments and developer focus, IDEs like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and, and languages, Microsoft cleans the board on that. There's no, compa there's no comparison. And then when you look at things such as um, um, GitHub, the massive acquisition by Microsoft a while ago, already having something called DevOps, which is very many similar overlapping technologies that Microsoft were building on their own as well. They own that part now entirely. And AWS and Google cannot compete with that. And I don't see that they ever will be able to, honestly. Um, that's, that's an interesting aspect of it. And in the early days of the cloud, when AWS figured out, let's sell our excess server power, you know, because we have so many servers, let's sell servers because, or lease them or rent them out to people, right? That's how the cloud was born. AWS coined it as a concept. And then Microsoft came on and said, okay, we're gonna offer you a platform service, not an infrastructure service. You're gonna be able to deploy your application here. We'll take care of all the hardware. You don't need to, don't think about a VM. It's not there. Of course, Microsoft had to deliver the VM, but it wasn't the first thought. It was the second thought they had uh, to deliver. Uh, so Microsoft has had this focus on, on enabling, but removing a lot of the complexity, such as the hardware, such as, the VM. We don't care about that. We wanted you to be efficient. We didn't want you to, to bother with the nuts and bolts. So there are many factors in my view that, that gives Microsoft a, a solid edge. I love yeah, and I think Yeah. Yeah, I think to add to that, Magnus, uh, so if you look at any, you know, fast, you know, you like go back five, six, seven, ten 10 years back, you look at any IT company, but the foundation of IT was you have to have some, you know, servers, you have to have some computers, you have to have a network, you have to have a data storage, you have to have, you know, uh, some way to stream those, you know, data to internet, right? Mm -hmm. So if you combine all that, and you know, you, you have to have these network engineers, you have to have DBAs managing your databases, then you have to have, you know, these, uh, it deployment engineers, their job was just to, you know, application, take the application and package it, install it and deploy it on different servers and make sure servers are running, make sure, you know, we are checking error logs, make sure we are checking in, you know, in, in your log files and so on and so forth. Now today in cloud world, as, as an IT company, I don't need a full-time DBA, right? And my developers can do that because data, 
base, I don't need to worry about the database aspect of it, the server part, all I need to worry about is the data. And if you look, we don't need network engineers or so-called system administrators anymore because I know my network, my server is going to up and running 24-7 without any problems. And then I don't need to worry about my how much storage I have because it's a scalable. More data, more data I need put there. Automatically, my cloud is there. It's configured to add more storage. And same thing about you know computing power. Same thing about your other tools you have in the back end. So this hardware part alone saves so much money and time for these companies. So you know, what I'm point I'm making is the cloud is going to eventually everything will move to the cloud. You know, we like it or not. There are some companies that are still doing their own local databases, data sources. They still have their network. But, you know, in the long run, you look at the cost and time, it saves everybody a lot of money. And then on top of that, as Magna said, there's so many built in services already there includes your, you know, cognitive services, all those and your you know data models there so it's all there all you have to do is plug and play so now our software development of you know it takes so less time and no literally no work from us all we have to do is just figure it out and what we need yeah yeah thank you all for your input on that question again um so next question i'm going to direct towards alan and of course you can all chime in but alan i know you work on several startups. Um, so what kind of cool stuff are you building with startups recently? OK, so that's a really interesting question. Uh, first of all, my main startup right now um, is actually really boring. Right? <laughs> it's not a boring company. It was very boring. And um, uh, we, we've had a, a couple of conversations with Mahesh on um, some of the um, the growth mindset um, uh, uh, events that we've had, and they're well worth tuning into because it's great insight. Um, and one of the things that I say about this is, listen, if you want to do a um, a, a, a startup, um, don't do something just because it's cool. Do something because there's pain involved, right? There's got to be pain involved if you want to make that, su that startup a success that will actually sustain you, sustain your team, sustain your family and their families, and become something that is... Um, uh, uh, can can keep you all going, okay? That's that's one thing. Um, and you can always find some cool stuff. I'm doing some very cool AI stuff and stuff with big data and everything else. But I also advise a couple of other um, folks and, and startups, um, and they're doing some interesting things with AI. One of them is a, a company that's involved with um, doing uh, um, these uh, food pods, right? So they're trying to bring um uh the the food that we grow um from the farm to the city and we're talking not just about city farms but these little portable pods that you can bring into your workplace and you can have fresh food in all those spare corners that you have and it's it's growing all the 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 vitamins and everything else that you need and that's that's really cool because they're using all sorts of technology to um, measure the um, the growth of maybe the, the greens and the lettuce that you're going to eat and make sure it's getting the right vitamins and it's checking for diseases and it's adding all the right nutrients and everything else. Um, another one that I'm, I'm uh, involved with at the moment um, is also really interesting. Um, uh, it's a, a group and they're involved in them, a smart city project in Morocco. And what they're doing there is they're actually building a complete new city from the ground up for 30,000 people, okay? Not been done before. This is awesome. It's um, the, 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 the building um, costs alone are over $1 billion. Um, and it's been going for a while, and now they're really starting to ramp up. But the bit that I'm involved in and I'm trying to um, uh, break out um, is the whole area of digital twins, Right, so digital twins around a brand new start, a, a smart city, which is a greenfield situation, is completely awesome. And like even this concept of what the heck is a digital twin, right? Um, I, I always hear these things like digital transformation and digital twin, and I go, oh God, it's just rubbish, you know. Until you can give me a concrete example of what you actually mean. But digital twins is actually cool. It's basically a a, a digital or an online um, uh, 
a representation of some physical thing. So you've all seen um, uh, previously uh, things like um, a, a green screen represent representation of maybe an aircraft engine, right? You see like sort of half the real engine and half this, this green screen uh, wireframe thing. Uh, and that's kind of it. So if you think about a, um, a building and you think about um, the uh, air conditioning and the heating in that system, and you think about the lighting in, the, in that building and about the elevators that go up and down, um, and where do all the people congregate and how can you have the optimal conditions and environment and everything else. So all that fits in. But now I want you to think about that and I want you to multiply it by a million fold because it's in an entire city. And how do you map this and how do you do this? And there's all sorts of interesting things that have gone on around this. Like, for example, um, down in um, one of our beloved cities down in India, in Jaipur, um, they wanted to go and, and map the entire city for a digital twin. And, of course, one of the problems they had was privacy. Because guess what? They did not want Google coming in and mapping their, their uh, area with their uh, uh, cars. So they went around and they uh, got a local company and um, uh, they did some work with some you know, existing CAD models they had and everything else. But Jaipur is an amazing city because you know, it's on all of these hills and everything else. And um, uh, it's so beautiful. But um, one of the problems with it is that it's so old. It's got all these narrow streets and it's so down hills and everything else, right? Mahesh, you know it well. And and what do you do to be able to go in and map a city like this? Well, what they did was um, they got some local um, uh, uh, IT engineering companies. They linked in with the universities and they made these backpacks, okay? And the backpack had a portable laptop in it, which had a little LIDAR, um, a little sort of uh, local radar detector thing, which you can get for a couple of hundred bucks these days. And they got students to go out and just walk around the whole area. Um, and this mapped the entire thing and then brought it back in and they put that into digital twins and, and they're just doing these amazing things with it right now. It's really, I remember seeing Magnus um, the first time in Chandigarh uh, uh, standing up on a stage, yep, all those years ago, standing up on a stage in Chandigarh and Magnus was talking about this new thing called serverless technology. And he stood up there and he said, da, 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 and I heard about serverless and my mind was blown. And, you know, I wished I had hair like Magnus because then it would look like it was my mind was blown like Magnus is going right now, okay? Um, but when you think about this type of stuff here that we're doing right now, we're going around with kids on backpacks, we're um, allowing um, the type of technology that's on a Roomba Hoover to go and map the inside of a building and the back streets in Jaipur, and we're bringing all that back and we're having it in 3D on our, our screen, up in the cloud on Digital Twins. Wow. I am so jealous of anybody who's like one quarter of my age to see where we're going to be in 20 and 30 years time. It's just phenomenal. So the cool stuff that's out there, there's so much, there's so much cool things um, uh, I, I want to do and there's so many cool things that I'm doing and seeing right now, but it all boils down to one thing, machine learning. If we don't have the machine learning, none of this gets driven, okay? Um, and I know there's some other really interesting um, uh, things to talk about, um, and I really want to jump into one of the things that Magnus said because I think it's so important. He mentioned um, uh, two words, well, it's four words, low code, no code, um, and he talked about um, uh, the removal of all of this friction and barriers to being able to do things that we did in the past. Um, and one of the things that we're doing now, and I'm doing it in my company, which is really boring, right? But it's really interesting as well because it's so cool, is we are um, using AI and other things to allow people who don't have the training of an engineer to do things that an engineer can do with big data and with analytics, right? And this is a huge thing that we're seeing as well in the cloud. It really, really sits on top of what Magnus and Mahesh said um, because we're removing and lowering barriers. And nobody can do this, I swear to God, nobody can do this except Microsoft because they're out there, they have everything integrated, they have um, the power platform. Um, we have a guy, you can go and, um, uh, I was gonna say um, uh, uh, Bing it up, but nobody knows what that means. They think Frank Sinatra, right? Um, I say these days, bingle it up, but I mean you combine Bing with Google. You go and bingle something up, right? So go and bingle up um, uh, Heathrow Airport and Power Applications. And you come across this amazing character, and he wasn't IT savvy at all. He wanted to get some um, stuff moving around uh, in his um, uh, organization. He discovered Power Apps, 
and suddenly somebody who is not an engineer using this low code low tech technology that magnus is talking about can remove all that friction that magnus is talking about can leverage all of that um background um uh, automation and transformation that mahesh was talking about and suddenly you're allowing people who don't have this level of background knowledge to do what someone who has 20, 30 years of experience has. And that's awesome. Not because it's doing me out of a job, because it isn't. It's freeing me up, May, to do all the cool stuff you want me to do. Whoa. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, to add that to Alan, um, I can, I work with the startup. So we are working definitely with some cool startup and uh, augmented reality is growing a lot. There's more need for augmented reality uh, after Apple and Google launched their kits. And then another thing is gig economy apps, right? Gig economy is growing big, big. Everybody wants to, to work from their own. They, nobody wants to work, be an employee. So apps like, <clears throat> you know, where you can order, you know, your services, your food, and that's, that's growing a lot. Um, I also see a growth in obviously they all involve AI, by the way, almost in some form or shape, they all involve AI and machine learning and in cloud, obviously. So think of that, you know, whatever we, everything is being built, it's on cloud. It uses some kind of machine learning algorithms and so on and so forth. And then we're also working on a one cool startup. Actually, it's launched in India called GoPure. And GoPure is focusing on health, wellness, as well as gig economy combined, and obviously uses it's in the cloud and using machine learning. So it's a lot of cool stuff going on. Awesome, thank you. And Magnus, do you have anything to add? Are you involved? Oh, in sure. uh, they, I think they gave such a complete answer to this one. Yeah. <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm starting to think that AI is pretty important. So. Um, Good thinking. <laughs> All right. So next question, um, Magnus, I'll direct this one towards you. Uh, if someone is building a new software application, why should they build it in cloud and BTW? And what is cloud native? Yeah, what is cloud native? Uh, <laughs> um, and should they build it in the cloud? Okay, fine. So yes, they should. But let me actually make it very simple first and say, you don't necessarily have to run your workload in the cloud. It's probably a, you know, oftentimes, very often, it's a good idea. But you absolutely have to do your development and your test in cloud. So the whole notion of having your own test servers, your own machines to do your testing on and so forth, or, or the age old notion of saying, okay, we used to have this production environment, but it got a little old. So we got a new one. We invested in a whole new set of production servers and we still had the old ones and they were still running. So let's use the old ones for development and testing. And then we deploy the to production on the new ones, which is absolutely stupid, but we didn't have cloud technology. So we couldn't really have uh, the testing, the, the deployment, the final testing done on machines that were exactly like the ones that were in production. So you were effectively testing your system on servers that were not exactly like production. But that's old before the cloud. So now with the cloud, I don't necessarily say you have to run all 100% of your workloads in the cloud, but you have to do your development and your testing using the cloud because there is no financial model that's going to compare to that at all. Because you should be automating the things you do. You should be deploying things automatically. You should be doing you know, all the, the things that tech people do, uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment and automation and infrastructure as code, all the beautiful code names that we tech people use. Absolutely use that. And then when you go home on a Friday evening or even overnight when nobody's in the office, nobody's working, you literally delete all the things that you have for development and testing from the platform. It's gone and it's costing you zero, exactly zero. And then in the morning, you can have an automated deployment that sets everything up for you the way it was when you arrive at office, I don't know, eight o'clock, you start the coffee maker in the office, you get your first co cup of coffee and you go to your desk and start working and it's already there because it was automatically set up at 7.30. There's nothing that's going to compare to that. And the agility, the mindset, the infrastructure as code and these, these uh, values are going to add to your world uh, very much. 
Then when it comes to, should I deploy my application in the cloud? That's a great question. There are a couple of factors there. I work with, with uh, national uh, critical infrastructure uh, in, in Denmark right now. And um, some parts of that cannot be in the cloud. And some parts of that actually works disconnected as a secure enclave without connection to any other system outside. Because it, it has to be, right? It's, it's national power grid infrastructure, so really. Um, but, but apart from that, you know, most other applications can. And then it was like this whole conversation about having public endpoints. So some of the applications you have need to be internal inside the corporate network and, and uh, the capacity to build networks uh, that extend from your on-premise, from your ground, onto the cloud, onto a, a public cloud data center is there and you can shut everything off so you're inside your own network and nobody can connect to it, great. And now te technologically, all the services that are in the platform can disable the public endpoint. And so you can have applications running in a, a public cloud data center which are completely secured, no one can attach to them. So you have that option as well even if you don't want to uh, have a, the ability for someone on the public internet to connect to your application, it's still possible to do it in the cloud today. And then of course, there's this other, other uh, category of, of applications that are targeting public people as in your customers or somebody like that who needs to connect to your website or your service. So it depends on the category. Um, more applications than you know are appropriate to run in the cloud. Um, so I, it's a depends on too many things, but I, I would say the short answer is yes, you should run it in the cloud. And then um, you can start to peel off the few applications from there that might not be a suitable match. Isn't it correct, uh, Magnus, and you would know far better than I would, um, uh, that if you were, for example, a large organization or a government body or something, and you want to have the benefit of the cloud, um, but for all of the legal reasons and security reasons, you don't want it to be sitting on the cloud, you can have your own as your cloud now physically inside your four walls, can't you? Isn't there something you it can do with that? It's possible. It's not uh, at the same level as the public cloud because all the new innovation gets pushed to the public cloud first. But there's an Azure stack, which basically means or literally means you buy some hardware and you put the, <clears throat> the Azure cloud on that. And, yeah. And run multiple services that are also available, the same things that are available in the Azure cloud. Um, and there are some great benefits to that. You get the you get some good parts of the technology shift from pre-cloud to cloud, except still on your own data center. Uh, of course, the, the, the limitation is obvious. Uh, they will roll the, any new feature to the public Azure cloud immediately, and and you will not get the same feature set and and at the same time as you get in the public cloud. But yeah, there's there's the option to do that. And I, I actually seen some people using development and test in the public cloud, and then they take that same application and deploy it to the private, their own cloud, which is might even be disconnected. But it's it's difficult to run cloud technology still on disconnected hardware. Can I ask you one more question in relation to the end part of, of what May said? And again, you know, a hell of a lot more than, than I do in this area. Um, uh, when we say cloud native, right? Um, yeah. If I was to go off and I was to do an application, you know, go and do something, um, maybe I'd do it like in C sharp, and I, I maybe mm -hmm. it was a, a web type thing. I'd maybe go, you know, file a new website, and then I'd think, okay, well, a few years ago, I'd have to upload all my DLLs to a an IIS server or an Apache right. server or something. Um, uh, and you know, as an architect, and all of us here either architect or have architected systems either before or we still do. Um, and previously, it was all the always the case that um, you know we we would think about um, what we were doing, and we would split out our database and our business logic and our um, domains and all these different things, right? So if if I sort of say, right, well, um, I'm going to forget everything that I did 
you know, 15, 20 years ago um, when I had physical servers and even um, seven or 10 years ago when I was just dealing with virtual machines as, as an infrastructure, as a service, right? And I'm trying to think more, okay, so um, someone coming out of college right now who is unencumbered by the enterprise uh, legacy knowledge that I have in my head, right? right. And they're only, there's some magic college somewhere, because I know this doesn't exist except on C-sharp corner, thank you. But there's some magic college out there that teaches these folk the cloud native way of doing things, right? So from the ground get go, from an architecture as a business person, if I say to my CTO, I want you to go out there and do this thing cloud native, does this mean that everything is serverless? Does this mean that we use, you know, a native mm -hmm. cloud database? What does that mean, cloud native, from that point of view? That's a great question. So there's this this uh, general industry movement towards platform services away from infrastructure services because almost nothing of what we do actually does require us to even care about the infrastructure as such. It's not the interesting part. The interesting part is to deliver an application. And if you deploy that using some sort of a Kubernetes something or some sort of other service, like in, an, in AWS, it would be an Elastic Beanstalk or in Azure, it would be an Azure App Service maybe. Uh, that's all platform services and, and they're, not, uh, they're not concerned with the hardware as such. That is, that is of, of course, a, a trend in the whole industry that the way we architect, the way we build applications, we don't think about those things anymore. And so I like your angle with the, the young person or the person coming into the industry now um, compared to uh, another aspect, which is a startup. Um, which startup would go and think today, like, oh, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna get this startup going. So I need to now get some, some, some venture capital, and I need to go and purchase some hardware and the hardware components, and then we need to lug them back to our offices, right? And start putting them to, together, right? We we buy a cheap IKEA bookshelf, and we we put the actual physical pieces of our hardware on top. No. No startup will ever, ever think like that again. Furthermore, every startup now would actually think global from the beginning. They wouldn't bother to build anything unless it's global from the start. And, and it's actually a very big shift in mindset and, and how, how younger people and startups would think about the world. Um, Again, I work with with something which is very heavily IT old uh, stuff, and and there's a very interesting set of challenges um, modernizing something that has you know 20, 25 years of IT history legacy behind it. And there are so many interesting things that you can do, but cloud native is obviously not a lot of the the, the technology that the the partner that, that I consult with now actually do. But still, they also have new applications, new services that they are going to build and about to deploy. So they're also on this journey to understand what it means to be cloud native, if you will. It, it, for me, that mostly means that you're untethered by, by any physical aspects at all uh, in terms of capacity, in terms of hardware. There are no limits. Uh, these uh, cloud uh, technologies are brilliant no matter regardless which cloud you choose to use they all have, can can enable your business tremendously they can enable a virtual no limit scenario for you with global availability and global capacity and that for me is cloud native when you think about it that way you you have no limits it's interesting as well um and i'm going to finish talking about cloud native on this particular one um, and I know Mahesh you can talk to this definitely um, because um, actually you dude wrote one of the first books that I ever read on C sharp many years ago um, so thank you for that learning right <laughs> but what I'm going to say is um, it's interesting um, you know um, uh, we talk about the cloud native aspect whoa there we go. There it's we been, go. It's been twenty years. I wrote yeah. that book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that book. Wow. Okay. So, um, 
Uh, the interesting thing is we talk about cloud native and from a business point of view, we talk about cloud native and the benefits and um, even a startup, you mentioned the words um, or the word Magnus global. And when I'm going out as a startup and I write a new application, um, I don't I don't have to worry about, oh, do I deploy this in um, uh uh, Ireland or in Stockholm or in New York, because I know that if I get um, customers in those areas and they're experiencing lag, I can just switch a button that says, well, spread the load across the planet, right? Because we're doing this stuff now, yeah. literally planetary scale. Yeah. But if we dig right down and we go down, down, down deep, it's interesting how um, it's not just about those big choices but it's about the little choices. And what I'm talking about is even on languages. So for example, um, uh, uh, when I'm referring there to Mahesh started out and he, he, he wrote us that book on the ASP applications, um, uh, I had a, a client um, about two years ago and they started out not actually with C Sharp but with a Java application and it was getting deployed in the cloud. And the very best that they could do the very best that they could do with the constraints of Java was that um, their particular application was in general sitting around um, the one gigabyte mark of memory um, for one process that was running at any one particular amount of time. Okay, and Java is a you know it's an old enterprise tool. It's stood the test of time. It's still out there. It's wonderful. It's awesome and everything else. Right. However, um, Mahesh is just after going there now. So. Thanks very much, Mahesh. Um, so um, uh, one of the things that I did in my latest startup was I said, mm, interesting, um, what's out there now that's actually not encumbered by the past? And we know that you know, C Sharp and the technologies and everything else are, are pretty awesome. But one of the things that we were doing in particular was something that needed to have incredibly high parallelism, right? Um, and we were open to anything. So eventually what we did was we started writing our stuff in Go. And we now primarily use Go um, for all of our, our background um, services, if you like. Um, and it would be considered a cloud-first, cloud-native language. And um, uh, this is another example of where we're not just considering something cloud-native in the macro sense, but in the micro sense as well, where we're saying, even though we have these awesome things we can turn on and off, are they actually efficient? And, and can we make it more efficient again? And you mentioned earlier on, Magnus, um, the term that uh, used to send shivers down my spine, which was Kubernetes, right? I um, I was like, oh, Kubernetes. <laughs> it was like someone mentioning Angular. Oh, I'm yeah, going to unlock up, right? And it's like all of these things. Um, when you, uh, uh, you know, the unknown is scary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so anyway, um, what I'm getting at here is that um, we switched over to the Go language. We could have just chosen um, uh, C, C Sharp the way it was going, um, but it was still in beta at the time. So we went with Go and, and we're very happy with that. Um, another cool thing is that Go was initiated and, and brought up through um, the, the Google stack, um, but we're using that fully embedded now um, right down in our um, Azure architecture, right? right. Um, and the way we have every single thing employed now, again, from a cloud native stack point of view, um, we use Go, which is wrapped up inside um, uh, Docker containers, which is managed by Azure, or sorry, uh, uh, Kubernetes, which is overlapped by the um, Azure Kubernetes uh, service. So um, we're just basically writing these little apps, and then we're using um, the power of Azure, as you say, to not only um, grow on demand, but also to shrink everything down as well. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, for example, again, cloud native, one of the things that we're using for that is a thing called Kida, which you know well as well. <laughs> Um, and it's a bit of machine learning um, that monitors our uh, background um, uh, workload and says, um, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it um, getting behind time? Are we meeting our SLAs? Mm -hmm. um, and it goes off and, and does that. Um, and I think um, also very much part of the cloud native stack is open source. And I think that's been a huge thing that has enabled cloud and the cloud stack and the cloud explosion really over the past 10 years or so um, is the sharing 
of information and technologies through open source, um, whereas previously everything was um, uh, locked down behind these um, big castles. Um, now, in most cases, it's open and it's free. And indeed, you can probably talk as well to the um, uh, the openness that's in Microsoft. You, you you would have been involved a lot more than I would and have seen that over the years. Do you want to talk about that maybe and how that's helped? Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, briefly, I guess, but but the, the openness is pretty staggering. Um, I'm old enough for, I'm, let's say, experienced enough to have been here with the cloud when or when with Microsoft even before the cloud, and and I started my career uh, as a young uh, technician, um, and and back then obviously Microsoft was pretty much or very much the bad guy, right? Uh, now Microsoft has the the philanthropist Bill Gates um, working hard to give away all his money, but still earning more money than he can give away. But but technically, uh, also being a company that cares in that takes of this wealth of knowledge, technology, and money, of course, to, to really invest in enabling all kinds of scenarios that are open source, yes, and, and to pair with that other very important areas as well, where I see Microsoft making tremendous investment is in, in availability and accessibility for everyone and anyone, right? It doesn't matter what your limitation might be, right? Even be it financial, that's um, over. You can overcome that. But if you have some sort of a physical uh, impediment, um, visual, uh, auditory, anything, they they invest tremendous amounts. And using this, these uh, AI technologies, speech recognition, voice to text, and all kinds of technologies that they invest so heavily in, to to make this uh, really really shine to be available to anyone. Uh, empower, uh, I can't remember the Microsoft slogan right now. It's like empower everyone uh, to do more, be more, or something like that. But they're really serious about that. And and all the, the technologies that they have that have gone open source, it's a huge set. And if you are a startup and you're starting up right now trying to figure out how to build your thing, there are so many things that they give you uh, to, to get you going. Uh, to well, they literally want to sell you on their technology stack, right? On their platform, they want you to use their cloud, not the other guy's cloud, right? But there are so many things that they give you to get going, and and if you needed uh, development environments, you get that. If you need to deploy to Azure, you do that. And if you if you need technology, uh, as in languages and support for all kinds of things that are are able to run in the cloud and run in the Azure cloud, it's all there. Uh, it's 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 actually. A full set. I couldn't uh, be happier with where Microsoft is right now in terms of openness and embracing everyone and, and enabling anyone to to be as much as they can be. I sound like a Microsoft salesman, don't I? That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. Get paid for um, that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next up, I have a question. Um, for you guys about voice technology. I want to know your take on voice technology and who do you think now is the leader in this new technology voice? Echo, who is Magnus Magnuson? Magnus Magnuson, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on so many phone calls and I, I, I had to go and it's actually telling me now who Magnus Magnuson is in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think when you look at um, uh, different um, industries, I'm going to try and turn off my voice here right now. <laughs> you can't hear it. Maybe uh, it's bothering you. Yeah. When you look at different industries, you see different um, uh, uses and uh, leaders in voice. Um, voice, as Magnus, you know, um, talked about there is so, so, so powerful. Um, it is our default setting, right? The, the voice, the pen, right? Um, I remember seeing a thing um, uh, a couple of years ago 
And um, I mean, many years ago, right, we had Dragon Dictate and that was the best that we had for voice recognition. And it was truly, 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 truly bad. And um, when you imagine a, a dragon spitting fire, that's what that dragon did. It spat fire because it was so awful. Um, but now um, pretty much every... Um, uh, pretty much every talk that I do um, that is in person used to be. Um, when I'm doing my PowerPoint slides, I have the inbuilt um, uh, voice recognition going on. And one of the seriously, seriously cool things with the Microsoft Voice Translator is um, I can be talking in uh, English um, or I can be talking in a different language and Magnus can sit there and he can listen to it in his native Swedish or um, uh, somebody in India can listen to their native um, uh, Hindi or um, somebody in Germany in German or whatever. Um, and we truly have a Babel fish, right? We, we, we truly have that right now. And then when we look at the um, uh, expansion of voice into other things and we can say... Um, what else does does voice do? And we look at the um, things not just about translation, but using the the voice as a bridging tool to um, enable people to be part of the um, technological environment that they couldn't be hitherto. You think of um, uh, one of the greatest minds that our world has ever seen. Um, uh, uh, Professor Hawkins, um, and you think of um, everything that he was able to do, and you know that that voice resonates in our head when we when we hear his his name. We we hear that computer computer speaking and everything else. Um, but I think that uh, it is very 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 underestimated um, what voice technologies are able to do for us, and while people. Um, at the moment, I think people by default think of Amazon and Alexa or Google when they come to voice um, because that's in their ubiquitous phone that's in their hand. Okay, What they don't see is they don't see the work that's going on in the background with voice. They don't see um, the uh, voice translation and recognition. They don't see the um, use of um, voice encoders and decoders and translators and sentiment analysis and everything else that's going on in the background and is enabling entire industries to um, uh, to work. Um, I know that, for example, on, on uh, a number of banks that I've worked with and a number of call centers that I've worked with, they use voice technology, which is based on Cortana, um, uh, listening in the background to actually tell us what the sentiment of somebody's voices as they're talking. So if you're on a call center um, and somebody is being angry or you, you think somebody is saying one thing with their meaning another, um, that comes through, right? So it's really interesting that people think Alexa and, and Google think, but actually there is more going on in the background with voice than there actually is on the surface, um, uh, especially in relation to using voice as a bridge to do other things. Um, and we see this as well in mixed reality. So where we have um, uh, the HoloLens, for example, um, uh, and we have engineers out in the field, and they're using their hands to do things. They're, they're seeing the overlay of the reality on the world that they're trying to do and everything else. Um, but they're using their voice as a tool. And um, people forget about that. So I think that um, uh, the uh, the next explosion that we're going to see um, is in the processing of the voice in the background um, and what it can do to assist. So it's not just about um, saying uh, echo, play my, actually, I don't want to say that. Please, echo, do not listen to me. Uh, uh, play my, my Spotify list or something. Um, it's more to do with... Um, uh, when I come into my office in the morning, I say, um, uh, uh, computer, um, turn on. And I've got it connected up. I, I have my um, house at the moment, and I'm connecting them up with these um, Sonoff devices. And um, I uh, have everything connected with IoT, so it's all voice controlled. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's what goes on in the background um, is more interesting and more important than um, the names that we see. Hope that gives something on that. 
Yeah, definitely. Magnus, do you have any final thoughts on voice to add? Uh, well, I, I better because it appears my video is frozen. So that's a very <laughs> good opportunity to, to use the voice, I would say. I'm still here, but my video, I, I'm glad I made that face when my video froze. <laughs> but anyway, uh, to sort of round this off, this has been an incredibly interesting topic or, or, or opportunity to, to talk uh, together here. But when it comes to voice, of course, voice controlling things, we're still in sort of a, the infancy of, of uh, the um, technology understanding when we talk to it. Uh, I still hate when I have, to, I have to say echo something and it's just annoying me. Uh, I'd rather it understood when I talk to it and it could differentiate when I'm talking to it and then when I'm talking to, I don't know, my mother standing next to it, right? Uh, to, to talk about something which is not technologically uh, enabled at all. Um, and, and, and I think that's, there's, there's more to be had here. And the future is, is uh, very interesting for this space. Uh, of course, the, the Babel fish, uh, love the Douglas Adams reference there, is, is a given, uh, I think, uh, to, to be able to just disconnect from languages, actually, uh, and to be able to talk to each other across language barriers. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And we're actually, a, we have achieved technologically uh, the under, language understanding uh, of biotechnology to really understand what we mean. And that's incredible. So there's there's much more to be had here. But I, I guess we're running out of time here. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for your final thoughts, Magnus and Alan. And thank you for joining us today at the new Business Council Summit. Um, it's been such an honor to listen to both of you and your input and all of your knowledge of AI and new and emerging technologies. And um, thank you to Dennis, who is running this whole thing behind the scenes and um, all of the other speakers and all of the other conferences broadcasted today. Um, it was such a great opportunity and wish you guys a great rest of your day. All right, thanks. Thanks very much, everybody, for having us. Much appreciated. Um, and best to look in the rest of the uh, conference. Thank you all. I'm joining now. So it's been a big pleasure. I've been listening, like you said, in the shadows. It's been a fantastic technology way of wrapping up a day that has been going for 10 hours almost. So, but uh, you guys made a very good, uh, more deep technological. A lot of things. I, I like some of your views about AI and technology and a very insightful. I live as well in Sweden. So, Magnus. Uh, so I have I have that experience with that uh, that uh, country and experience and and great to have as well all the C sharp community worldwide listening to us but as well our audience with the Open Business Council Summit and hopefully like you mentioned at the beginning of the panel that you can actually make AI I have some my doubts that you can actually do as good as you put it <laughs> but uh, but I I'm working for that that's the purpose of this event and other events yeah. like this yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you. So for everyone listening to us around the world, I'll do the final remarks uh, for the ones that stay with us until, until this moment and for the ones that joined us recently. So we it was a long day. Uh, an amazing list of uh, around 50 speakers and um, a lot of people from governments to big corporations as well, a lot of startups, a lot of thought leaders, CEOs. And uh, I think some of the conclusions of the day is that I think everyone, especially during this day, and I'm very happy with that, is that we, we share the same common vision of using technology to make the world a better place but as well uh, a way of looking how can we accelerate uh, the rhythm of digital transformation and especially making sure that uh, all the areas related with uh, all this technology, that, uh, all these experts that actually are, are tools we can use to make really good, not just to disrupt our society, but as well very practical things. So tomorrow we have a new day. Um, and the new summit day that we'll have another close to 50 speakers from all over the world. We start as well as um, 8 a.m. UTC time, so London time. And we start actually with a fireside between the Minister of Science and Technology of Japan 
and as well uh, Eric van der Cleef, that is actually the one of the the architects of the London Tech City that became Tech Nation, London Tech Nation or UK uh, uh, Smart Nation, and um, as well um, we have uh, one of the directors of the Bangladesh government, uh, Vietnam, and a lot of other governments, but as well a fantastic list of experts and thought leaders that are really pushing the boundaries and as well making sure that this theory, the practice and the ideas behind the practice can work. Uh, digital transformation is here. We discussed, especially in the last panel, it's interesting to synthesize a lot of the ideas in terms of technology from digital twins. That is one of the areas that I'm particular, very, very uh, excited. So from digital twins to AI, blockchain, the fourth industrial revolution, society 5.0, all of this is taking uh, our world by storm. And of course, COVID-19 just put all of this upside down and accelerate that. And I think that's what we discussed today. Very concrete things. You can actually follow us on our YouTube channel. Most of the things on the YouTube channel are visible and available after the panels. Of course, we have the lives. Um, you can interact with us as well. I'll try to see if we can actually be more interactive for the people that are with us live. We have today 20,000 people. And before the event, we reached 2 million people already. So it's been a pleasure and I'm very humbled for all these people reaching us around the world. I want to thank you all and thank you especially all the speakers, participants, and as well people that made this event possible. This is an event of social impact. Um, there was not a lot of economical movements here. We've been uh, investing on making this an event that actually can actually uh, really create change, but as well be a motivator to create an ecosystem and everyone listening to us around the world can join to be part of this and make sure that we really make a world less dystopian and the world where we can actually still believe that we can use these tools to make it better so thank you all from all over the world with all my heart and i thank you as well our team from serafina uh, sinkina hilton supra ernaldo uh, and silvia rachel and a lot of Leon and a lot of people around the world that have been helping us making this possible. We've been as well working with the C Sharp community with Startup Bangladesh Limited, that is a platform that has been collaborating with us. And uh, all the different organizations have been working with us from GMAX to, of course, our websites. Um, and I want to thank everyone involved from openbusinesscouncil.org, that is our biggest platform, and as well focus on creating a decentralized, distributed, um business ecosystem that uses blockchain to create a certificate for businesses and is already in beta and we are trying to bring thousands of business to create a profile for this business a bit like a wikipedia crunch base for businesses where you actually can look at the business if you try to do business between different countries i want to as well thank you um to all our other platforms so citiesabc.com that is a platform to create a data a benchmark for cities and citizens and of course, our websites, intelligenthq.com, fashionabc.org, tradersdna.com, and edgefink.com. So thank you all. It's been a privilege to be here. And uh, the ones that are up for the next challenge, tomorrow there's more. Thank you so much.